What we should do now is uh, um, do two things simultaneously because you and Marijn have a project together which you started. So Marijn, can, can you join us here? Because you have prepared a little bit of a presentation uh, for that as well. And it answers, that's the second thing that we do, uh, one of the questions that came up in the chat, namely, do you have anything for master students to do? Because I know this is a project that involves master students. <laughs> Very smooth transition, yes. yes. <laughs> um, we do have a, a shared research project in collaboration with ETZ Hospital and, that, uh, and this research is based on the not one but two master theses from the DSS students. Uh, Hannah and Gerrit, if you're watching, thank you very much for collaboration. Um, so let's get into it. Um, basically, the goal of this project was to predict patient deterioration using data science methods. <laughs> and deterioration here is for those patients that are already in the hospital and that will at some point uh, deteriorate. And that means an ICU admission, so uh, emergency care. And uh, of course, this needs to be unplanned because uh, sometimes people are admitted directly to the ICU, but those we exclude. And we defined this as 20, uh, in the window of 24 hours forward. Now, current clinical practice is based on a score that's called the MUSE, the Modified Early Warning Score. And this is a score that is taken ideally every 24 hours or maybe even every shift of nurse, uh, the nurse shift in the hospital. And it includes quantitative uh, vital signs and clinical observations. And one of the important uh, things that we found in the data set from the ETZ is that there is a column called the gut feeling of the nurse, which is actually quite uh, telling uh, onto which patients will deteriorate or not. And there's a second contender, which is a, the DI model, the deterioration index, that is generated by the electronic health record uh, company software, uh, the, 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 uh, the records, yeah, basically assigned these values um, in the background, and that is a proprietary model by the, the company Epic. So here is an outline of the Muse. And you can see that uh, there is a couple of columns here that indicate several uh, domains where people can go, of course. Uh, in green is the to be expected values, yellow is slightly worse, and red is the no-go zone, basically. So we can see that there is a breathing frequency, uh, oxygen supplementation, uh, heart frequency, systolic blood pressure, uh, consciousness, etc. So these scores are converted to ordinal ranks, so zero for no problems in the domain and three for increasing severity, basically uh, following the ABCDE criteria of emergency care, uh, leading to a maximum of 27 points, and that is really, really bad, of course. A traditional cutoff in the hospital is a MUSE higher than or equal to seven, which would uh, trigger a uh, intervention by what is called a rapid response team. So some people come, come over and see what's what with this particular patient. Now, the data set that we worked with was provided by the data warehouse. Uh, we want to thank Inge and Hype there to, uh, to work with us and have carefully uh, uh, put a light on all the blacks, the blind spots that we had in the data and that they could figure out what was going on. And there's about 500 days uh, here of data. Uh, this, the, the data collection period also included COVID, so there's, uh, there's some words about that maybe in the end. And as you can see that there is the majority of the patients fortunately do not deteriorate, but there is a slight minor, there is a very small minority that does deteriorate. And the balancing act that we have to do here is we have to devise a model that raises the alarm only for those patients that are actually going to deteriorate and ideally doesn't miss any of them without leading to alarm bells going off all of the time. We call this alarm or they call this alarm fatigue, something we learn about. Um, that would uh, intervene with uh, clinical practice uh, yeah. just on a, you know, what is possible to do basically um, in practice. So you can see here, there were some exclusion criteria, uh, including having COVID. So this data, this model is fit on only non-COVID deteriorations and a couple of others. So there were two approaches, uh, a machine learning based approach and a deep learning based approach. And Gerrit was uh, responsible for the machine learning approach. Uh, which um, focused on explainability and used random forest as a main uh, method. We can see here a list of features that were selected by some of some different methods to select features. 
And you can see actually that the mu's, so the traditional values are actually all in there, uh, all of, I guess all of them. So they do actually are, uh, they are of course very uh, relevant to this prediction uh, and this came out as well. Um, and so the results of this random forest analysis basically gave in the, in the best um, case, uh, a model with an F1 score of uh, about 20 and 27 uh, with a recall of 24%. So that is not, not um, too good actually. And a precision of about 30%. And interesting here is that the gut feeling indication alone, so just the nurse's evaluation already um, would outperform the, the traditional mu's or the I score. I think this is where I hand over to you. Yes. Yeah. So the second student, Hannah, uh, focused on uh, uh, deep learning neural network methods and uh, aimed to compare how they would perform using both static and dynamic data. In other words, uh, would collecting dynamic data lead to uh, improvements in uh, performance? Um, so one question, one research question was, does it make sense to take into account, let's say, the history of the patient? So as much data as, as possible from, let's say, something approximating a time series point of view. And the second question, uh, an interesting sub-question was also, how does the class imbalance uh, affect the performance and uh, should we do something about it in the training stage? So let me first focus on the data itself. So the static model is fairly similar to what Moran just described, uh, what uh, Gerrit was working on. We collect data on a particular day and we try to estimate the risk of deterioration of that patient in the next 24 hours. The dynamic model was trained uh, on a different um, input data set, namely a collection of the same measurements for the same patient, but three days in a row. So here I should already make a note that the results that I will uh, present are not directly comparable to the results of, uh, that Maran just presented because of course the, uh, the test set was different the, and, the, and the training set was different because here we only worked with uh, with those patients that were in the hospital at least three days. So as you can see here, we also have a, a very small event rate, but the event rate for the dynamic data set is already now 1% rather than the 0.03% that was presented by Marijn. So uh, patients who stay in hospital for three days apparently have a higher chance of uh, deteriorating, which probably makes sense as well. So uh, Hannah tested um, a various levels of, uh, let's say, upsampling the training set so that um, the training set then uh, included different uh, event rates. And we will see in a few slides time uh, how they all performed. First of all, the more general uh, results, we can see that uh, the static um, MLP uh, method already uh, produced decent results in terms of recall uh, higher than MUSE, in terms of uh, precision a little less than MUSE, but in terms of the F1 score uh, slightly higher than MUSE. We can see here also an interesting result for us is that uh, Hannah's experiments also validated that MUSE outperforms DI exactly the same as, it, as, as, as was the case in Gerrit's thesis. Uh, like I said, there is no direct comparison possible between um, Hannah's results and Gerrit's results, but we've just included them here as a reminder. Uh, the random forest actually performed very similarly to uh, NLP. What we can see and what's very interesting to us is that uh, RNN, so the dynamic model, uh, performed very, very uh, much better than MLP or random forest or MUSE or DI. But like I said, it, this should be taken, uh, well, what should be taken into account is that the test set of course was different, but the difference is still quite stark. So the main findings to summarize, uh, both types of deep learning models outperformed MUSE and DI with MLP, uh, very similar to uh, Garrett's results on, uh, with random forest. And using a main conclusion would be that using dynamic data, if available, of course, 
is better than using only static data. So if you have a patient history concretely, it's better to use it than to just focus on the last measurements that you have. Yeah, and then I guess concluding, so we can say that uh, in this case, uh, when, when the data is available, the sequential models do outperform the static models uh, and hospitals can use this, um, this model to fine tune their uh, event rate, their alarm rate. So uh, trying to maximize the recall for a given acceptable number of, uh, of events, basically. But there's uh, some open issues. So we don't know too much about the calibration of relative risk that we've just uh, classified here uh, directly. Um, as mentioned already earlier, a validation on a different cohort is uh, very much required, either a different hospital or a, a different uh, sampling period maybe of patients. Uh, a side finding was that um, this, the model trained on non-COVID patients performed really worse on COVID patients because um, they would have different vital signs related to uh, deterioration or non-deterioration. So much lower saturation, for example, would be considered normal for a COVID patient and really uh, not normal for a non-COVID patient. But we think and hope that this model might be more used uh, in a way to, again, triage patients to, to indicate to the nurse uh, what, the, you know, the subject, what the subjective ordering of uh, relative risk is between patients basically saying which patients should you see next with the available time and resources that you have. Yeah. And in that sense, basically try to optimize the care as well. Well, that was quite interesting. Um, there are a number of open issues that you mentioned. Are you continuing this? Uh, do you need more master students for this? Yes, yeah, so all the master students watching, uh, please uh, join our project. Uh, there is an interesting uh, upcoming data set that actually, hopefully, uh, will use uh, continuous monitoring of patient data. So every 15 minutes uh, with some smart patches, and we would really hope to be able to use that uh, very rich data, data set to do more uh, sophisticated uh, time series models. Yeah, yeah you, you mentioned also uh, you know, there's a difference between COVID and non-COVID. So you might be people who are happy with the COVID crisis because that gives you a lot of data, but probably it's not just COVID and non-COVID. There are probably other categories as well. Yeah. You have any insight in that? Uh, some other students, so not outside of these two theses, have have done some work uh, with us on um, seeing or checking whether there are differences from one department to another department at the hospital, but. Um, we, we've seen indeed that there are def definitely different trends in different departments, but we haven't been able to, uh, let's say, quantify anything yet. No, so, so it's it's a, ongoing work. A lot to go on. There's actually here someone says, uh, could bachelor students also work on this? Uh, presumably, uh, yes. Yeah. Presumably, yes. Yeah. So the, the, that, there might be projects there as well, and it might be a nice preparation uh, for a master project uh, a bit later. Thank you.